Imagine you could step inside the minds of Canada's healthcare leaders, glimpse their greatest fears, strongest drivers, and what makes them tick. Welcome to Healthcare Changemakers, a podcast where we talk to leaders about the joys and challenges of driving change and working with partners to create the safest healthcare system. Welcome to Healthcare Changemakers, a podcast produced by Huroc. I'm Ellen Gardner with Michelle Holden and Philip D'Souza. Today, we're talking with Zaina Kayat and Will Falk. Zaina is Vice President, Client Success and Growth at Teladoc Health. Will is a senior fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute and has an appointment at the University of Toronto as an executive in residence at Rotman. Zaina and Will have collaborated in many different ways over the years and delight in wading into the messy problems in healthcare. They don't always agree, but Zaina and Will are united in their desire to use technology to move care forward. That task, they readily admit, is hard work. As they call it, the clash of the static and the dynamic. When the industrial age and the technological age collide with not always pleasant results. The real satisfaction comes from breaking down the barriers to thinking big and getting stuff done. The tools they're using and approach they're advocating doesn't just improve access to care, it delivers culturally appropriate care to communities that have been isolated in the past. It's all about hanging out with the future, something Zaina and Will agree is a highly privileged place to be. Welcome, Zaina and Will, to Healthcare Changemakers. It's great to have you. Right now, you're both involved in some really exciting projects around digital innovation. So I want to start by asking you about an exciting project you're working on now. Zaina, maybe you can start. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty new to this organization, Teladoc Health, which is uh, the world's largest virtual care company. I joined about five or six months ago. So uh, into a bunch of new projects, but not a lot I can talk details about just yet because we're still ramping up. But you know, the, the platform allows us to really enable new models of care, either for um, virtual care, mental health, and in chronic conditions. And maybe one I'll talk about is uh, a, a partnership we just formed with Microsoft Teams. Microsoft Teams is what everybody in healthcare is using for all their everyday communication, email and uh, meetings, uh, especially virtual meetings. And of course, a lot of health systems turned on Teams to do virtual visits during COVID because everybody was scrambling, uh, but it's not at all purpose built for a clinical engagement. And so now our software is built into Teams. So if you're a doctor or clinician, you're using Teams for email or for meetings internally with a little icon you click in and now you're into our entire platform. So this is, I think, a big deal for everybody because we're just making it that much simpler for anyone to you know, seamlessly be digital uh, without having to switch from one platform to another. So I'm excited about bringing that to Canada. The thing that really gets me going these days is working with uh, young young founder teams who are uh, dealing with uh, tough problems. Um, I've, uh, over the course of the last couple of decades, I've started uh, investing in and working with uh, companies, and I've had a, a chance to work with some tremendous um, founder teams. Um, right now, I'm working with uh, two. Uh, one um, is uh, Verto, which does digital twin technology, and the other one is uh, Chris O'Connor's latest gig, uh, First History, which is uh, redoing the, the way that we collect uh, history and uh, information uh, for new diagnosis. And both of those are just um, a complete blast. I know that you've been collaborating and working together for several years. So how did you meet and how did you discover that, yes, you both worked well together and shared a lot of things in common? I don't remember how we met, Sam. How did we meet? I kind of always knew about Zena, but we were in the same circles. And then we made this decision to do this intensive course at Rotman. And originally we offered the course in a week, which was insanity. And then we turned it into a full semester course, which was more sane and did it for uh, three or four years and had great student response from it. I'd say for me, uh, what draw me drew me to will is like authenticity and just real talk 
I find in healthcare part of why I think most of why we're stuck is how people think. And I find we we waste a lot of time on cliches and motherhood and just really inauthentic conversations that say all the good things, but don't get to the substance. And we got to get to the substance, right? There's so much unfinished business. And, and I find Will is one of the only people who can delicately walk the dance between, you know, you know, saying what needs to be said and based on evidence, not on opinion, about respecting the receiver and where they're at in a way they can digest it and actually shift their thinking. And honestly, Will, watching you do that over the years so delicately, (laughs) that kind of gave me permission to do so. That's incredibly (laughs) kind and also the first time that anyone's ever called me delicate. I've tried to help uh, on some of the thinking that Zane has done over the years on aging um, which has really, I think, laid the ground for uh, the next generation of solutions in that space. It's Philip here. Uh, I, I want to dig deeper into this. I like the I like the where the conversation is going, and uh, and I wanted to know between the two of you because I, I can tell you have a great amount of respect for each other, and you guys kind of just get each other. Has there ever been a moment where you disagreed, and you're just like, no, this is not this is not right. <laughs> Dozens of times, often in front of students. One of the great things about uh, having to teach MBA students and, and, and other learners, frankly, is having to explain yourself in front of really smart people um, who are trying to dig into an area. And, you know, in, in, in some of our courses, Zaina and I have come at uh, different problems from uh, different angles. Um, uh, and, um, that's great because having a uh, tension and disagreement up to a point is, is, uh, uh, an important part of any creative process. Will and I are both driven by like, we just want healthcare to be better. It's not about us or our career or money or like, like really driven to make it better. And so if that's your go North, that's it, right? Like you're just that you're. I'm on a discovery. Like I get challenged by Will, and then I think differently. That's great. <laughs> How do you avoid groupthink? Then I like have antibodies to groupthink. <laughs> <laughs> Language is mindset, right? And I just find like we have to use words that cut through the clutter, even when I'm in a hundred percent agreement with the group, because. It's just too easy to hide behind motherhood. I'll just give an example, like where I was preparing for a panel this week and then they're giving me this script and like, this is the answer they wanted me to have. Like healthcare is going to be radically transformed through compassionate collaboration. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, how does anyone act on those words? Yeah. (laughs) So I, so I just try to clear the clutter and then, and then, you know, go against the group when it needs to. And, and again, I find, Will, you do a great job of just bringing clarity to these complex concepts uh, with language and information that brings something new to the conversation. Okay, guys, enough mutual admiration. Let's get into some substance. I wonder, going back in time, when you first started doing this work on the impact of technological change, what did that field look like? And and did you get a lot of pushback from the beginning? So first off, I was dragged kicking and screaming into technology because I was working with a New York-based uh, strategy consulting firm. Uh, it was called APM, and we got bought. And this is like 1996. Uh, we got bought by Computer Sciences Corporation the year before I made partner. And um, so I went from being a strategist in academic medical center to being uh, a very small um, healthcare focused segment of a larger um, system integrator and outsourcer. And CSC was uh, one of the largest in the world at that time, defense and military. But it was such a fascinating way as a strategist to then get pulled into digital. Um, in those days, it was about um, uh, patient-facing websites and uh, uh, linking up the information pieces. You know, it's becoming it became increasingly obvious in the late '90s and into the 2000s uh, that uh, real investments had to be made. And of course, you know, the last two decades have been how those investments get made and linking things up. I don't think I ever had to pivot. I, if I look back, even back to grade school, the common thread in any choice I've ever made career-wise, even personally, 
uh, is I just go after the messy, intractable problems. Um, so that's just my DNA. For whatever reason, that's who I am. So that's never a thing I've ever had to even intentionally decide to do or not to do. It's just what I do. Uh, and then when it comes to like in healthcare, you know, there's a saying and, and caveat, I'm vegan, but uh, sacred cows make the best burgers. And so like for me, it's like as soon as I see the doubt, the skepticism, the, you know, it's impossible, then like I'm like, mm, time to double down. <laughs> Let's see, like, That's the lock. And I got the key. <laughs> um, and, and then the other thing I often say, like, you know, I, I used to give a lot of keynotes and stuff like that. And like, so I, I have a rule of thirds when I give my talk. A third of the audience is going to have their arms folded, grumpy and say she's full of SHIT. This will never happen. Wow. She's nuts. A third is like, tell me something I don't know, Zaina. You know, I'm so bored. I already know this. I'm already doing this. Like, really? And then a third is like, holy, my brain hurts. You've changed my mind. What do I do now? I'm questioning everything in my life. And that's kind of it. <laughs> Zaina, you have a wonderful name for the people hanging on to the old way of doing things. You call them the preservatives. And... I want to ask you how we are going to move away from that concept of place in healthcare and that, you know, we only believe good things in healthcare happen when people are in a place, in a hospital, you know, in a hospital bed, that we need to actually move beyond that. So tell us how we can actually move those preservatives away from that fixed position. We're emerging from an industrial era and healthcare is just just as much locked into an industrial age of static infrastructure for a service that is the most dynamic thing in the world, right? And, you know, it maybe was a little bit static before when people had one disease and, you know, they either died or got better and there wasn't the kind of complexity and definitely not the volume. So just this clash of the static and the dynamic. And so, you know, uh, it simply can't work and it won't work. And it's consistent with the rest of every other industry in the world that is emancipating from assets, physical assets that you get locked into that you just can't be locked into. And those include labor assets, right? So, you know, look, depending on the study and the context, about 70% of care does not require you to be in the same place, full stop. That could vary by, you know, person, by situation, but about 70%. That's the big number, folks. Like 70% will be replaced by software and other tools that allows a truly hybrid model. The second thing with preservatives is, you know, I, I get it, right? Like, you know, Will, I think you call these producer interests, but, you know, our obsession with facilities and also visits, because visits are still time sharing a place and a person's time. That's what a visit is. That's the currency of healthcare today. They're the poster child of how leaders and carers in these you know, institutions get like kinetically trapped in this industrial age mindset. And they're going to doomed forever, uh, be, be doomed to defend the model that allowed them to be so successful in the past. And, and I get that. And that's it. So then I just work from that as a starting point. Hospitals, generally speaking, in Canada had a very good pandemic. They were seen as highly reliable and important places, and they did uh, they did pretty well. The other thing is is that the pandemic has really surfaced our labor shortages, um, and it's become you know I mean we're, we we've been working people into the ground. Uh, now there's a variety of reasons that we've been doing that only some only some of which are pandemic related. Uh, others are the kinds of productivity issues that accompany a change, I'll use Zena's language, from an industrial age to an information age. Um, and, 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 you know, economically, it is very clear that in spite of large investments in technology, we have not seen the gains in productivity from that technology that we would like to in healthcare. I actually am at a place where I think we're going to be building more hospitals for the next while. And I do think that as we make the move away from institutions, we need to consider how we build more reliability 
into our non-hospital, non-institutional partners. Well, just speaking about the labor problem and the fact that it really became acute during during the pandemic, or we really realized we had a problem, we were pushing people to the edge. You dove deep and actually interviewed a hundred frontline healthcare providers at the time of wave three. And you you did find some shocking things. What were you expecting when you did that? And and what did you intend to do with the research you did? In talking to people, many of whom were on the front lines, as I was not during the pandemic, I was blown away by how hard people worked in spite of the technological choices that are available. We do not in this country, and globally this is true as well, we do not build healthcare technology solutions that are easily usable by either providers or patients. There is some great writing on this, but and I'll grossly oversimplify, clinicians hate their computers. And, you know, these are not people who don't like technology. This idea that doctors don't like technology, it's just nonsense. We produce in our industry terrible tech. Uh, Bob Wachter, the uh, chair of medicine at University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, has written a great book on this called The Digital Doctor. I think the subtitle is Why Doctors Hate Their uh, Health Records. Um, And there are other books on the same topic. Um, What we've got right now is we've got a situation where we forced solutions, and many of those solutions just failed during the pandemic. So, you know, to to Zaina's point, uh, Zoom and and Teams uh, got picked up and used. We're still at wave six. We're still somewhere between a third and a half virtual in terms of the services we deliver. I expect that that's probably about where we're stabilized for the moment, at least until we bring messaging on. Now the challenge is to make it work better, make it work better for patients, make it work better for clinicians. Zaina, I heard you on a on a recent talk show and you were talking about how technology is it's not really it's it's accepted by a lot of the healthcare population but there's a lot of people a lot of clinicians and patients who aren't necessarily um ready to jump in and i just wondered if you had thoughts on how healthcare leaders and governments can really support people in making the kinds of changes that are needed the answer to that is not get everybody to go to one thing, but rather, you know, what I call omni-channel or choice or, or having multiple modalities and just making them all work, which again is a tall order to ask from healthcare, which has been largely operating in one channel called in person. And then the other is for those though, where it is going to need some, let's call it skilling up or education or capacity building, whatever you want to call, you know, there's a lot going on in that area, right? So, you know, remember nursing used to have this thing called nursing informatics, right? Because nurses touch pretty much every decision about every patient. And so they needed to be the army to kind of carry the informatics torch. Well, now that's becoming pretty ubiquitous that, you know, um, uh, John Nosta calls this your TQ, your technology quotient is going to be the third leg of the stool with IQ and EQ, Mm. you know, emotional quotient and your intelligence quotient that like, that's just how it is because we live in a digital world. So, so I do find whether that starts all the way up to school or other enablement or us tool makers, us at Teladoc building in that kind of capacity development co-design with both patients and clinicians. It's part of our product. There's just no way around it. Right. So I think that's how you get around it. And just maybe a reference, if we're putting references in the podcast, you know, Dr. Eric Topol, who's kind of one of the these other gurus of the future in health and tech and innovation from Scripps, you know, he did a pretty seminal study with the National Health Service in the UK, where they looked at all the jobs in the whole UK. And I think, well, if I'm correct, they're the third biggest workforce well, in you, the whole world. A big anyone. Anyway. Yeah. One of the top three or four, maybe after Walmart and the Indian rail <laughs> <laughs> workforce. But um uh, and I think they concluded 90% of all the jobs, we're talking in the millions, uh, will change because of what's you know happening now and coming in tech. 
that's a massive reskilling, retooling, you know, of the current workforce, let alone how you breed and train the next generation. And so now they can now do a thoughtful strategy about the workforce that embraces this instead of treats it like an add on on the side and continues to train people in the old industrial era way. At Teladoc, you are working on some really interesting digital transformation models in rural Saskatchewan. And I want to ask you, why is a rural place, as opposed to, say, a Toronto or a Montreal, a good place to implement these models? I mean, I'd say there's two reasons. I mean, first, at the core is access, right? Like, that's at the end of the day, why are we in healthcare is to deliver care. And if you can't even access it in the first place, there's a major substrate to help really move things forward. So, you know, because, again, in the industrial area, care was constrained by place, uh, and time, as soon as our tools can decouple time and place from care, you've really got a game changer for access uh, uh, because, uh, you know, that's been the bottleneck. So so that's one where we can actually help a lot of people um, <laughs> get care and a lot of people who uh, care about people, um, you know, be delivering that care without having to be physically co-located. The second, though, I find why I love working what I call off the grid, whether that's rural or just out of the big centers is I find that's where I find uh, the least barriers to just thinking big and getting stuff done. You know, resources are constrained. So people don't have time to have a committee, to have a task force, to have a, you know, write a paper, to do an analysis, to then wait six layers of approval just to make a decision. They just kind of get on with it. They're really there to do the best stuff for staff and patients, uh, and they're not there to optimize for themselves and protect the past. And so uh, I, I just like working in that environment. Uh, they get on with it, and, and it, it makes me feel like I'm not you know, wasting my time doing a lot of bureaucratic stuff, and you know, my unit of time is actually moving care forward. So, so it's like a double win of improving access and actually getting stuff done. Have you gone even further into rural and remote communities? I'm thinking about First Nations communities, communities that are in the north where access is a problem, but it's it's not only access. There's other problems as well that they don't want to necessarily use the traditional yep. modes. So before, you know, we were doing pediatric neonatal ICU using our tools where like a little child in the northern Saskatchewan, if they literally need an ICU, don't have to get um, flown in uh, 600 kilometers away to the center in Saskatoon. We can fully take care of them with our neonatologist sitting in Saskatoon. Now uh, we're working on uh, within, using our tools. You know, how do we design culturally appropriate care for rural and remote First Nations communities well beyond this high acuity use case, but like everyday care, including acute care. So so that a child in a First Nations community doesn't have to go to those white people center in Saskatoon because there's a whole lot of trauma with the history of leaving your community to go to where the white people are. Uh, And so we're working uh, on how do we use a broader set of our tools to literally enable people to fully stay in their community no matter what the acuity of the situation is. So, and that's less about the care delivery and more about everything you just talked about, cultural sensitivity, language, empathy, (laughs) all these other parts of access that are not about just, you know, having um, access to a clinician. That's a very positive story. Will, did you want to say anything about that? I want to pick up on the equity theme on equity in virtual care. You know, the rural and the indigenous pieces are are, are well understood, and you guys have done a nice job of describing those. Less obvious to people are the impact on hourly wage wage earning employees um, and on families and people taking care of uh, older adults. Uh, Infoway has been doing really good work on this, and they have some results that are not yet published, but are being published in May, so I'm going to talk about them. Um, They have now estimated, uh, based on 2021 data, that the average cost of a physical visit is $99 for the average visit with outliers taken out. 
So taking out the big outliers, the big travels, they've said it's $99 per visit for most Canadians to see a doctor. That's uh, $25 for care for a dependent, $40 in lost earnings, $24 for travel costs, gas and parking and public transit, and $10 other. Those are big numbers, right? Like, like when you, we don't often think about it those that way, but if you think economically about the fact that a public visit to a free provider costs the average Canadian $99, well, no wonder that, I mean, that's a big barrier for a lot of people. And if we are serious about equity, and, and sorry, I should add, obviously there are a lot of people for whom it's a lot more than $99. But if we're serious about equity, we've got to really ask the question about what it is we are doing, insisting people, you know, get a babysitter and lose four hours of income in order to access a doctor. And I'll just add two other points to that from my personal lived experience being the caregiver for a lot of family and myself. You show up after spending the $99 and only be told, oh, everything's fine. Or now you don't go need to see another specialist. You need to go do another test. So like, it's like, what's the utility of even that in-person visit, right? So it's a double tax. Another one point I'll just make, which may be the next podcast I'm starting to see. And again, because we're the glo- we're global and we're the world's biggest virtual care company, the next thing to come after this equity thing is going to be the environment, right? Healthcare is among one of the biggest polluters and wasters, and and the um, the ROI to carbon <laughs> of again having an asset lighter version of doing the main currency of care, which is these visits, um, is going to start to become part of the dashboard and the KPI and the index and the measurement as every healthcare delivery org is going to have to have just as much responsibility to equity as they, uh, to the environment as they do to equity and all these other really important, um, you know, external factors in society. We're picking up on something here that I think is really important. I actually think that, that the change, like being short of talent, being short of hospital beds, needing to care about pollution is a different way of solving the problem than we would have even talked about it three years ago. I'm not conceding the compassion high ground to anyone who's advocating physical care over virtual care, because it is not at all clear to me that the compassionate answer for most people is to insist that they show up in your office when other alternatives exist. And, you know, it certainly isn't compassionate if they have to travel 500 miles. I I don't want to say that we're not going to have physical care or that laying on of hands isn't really, really important because it is. Are you both optimistic that we're we're moving in the right direction, that there's good things happening and that even if we have to, you know, move completely into virtual as a way to reduce our costs, is it going to happen? So in my view, you know, I think just the the basic transactional noise like of digitizing a bunch of processes that frankly should have been done 50 years ago, this is becoming the norm and not the exception anymore. That's my feeling, you know, in the trenches. And again, not innovation, not transformation. This is just good business process optimization. Um, so yeah, I think you know what I'm excited about next is as I'm seeing the leaders who did that, they now have an intelligence-based health system because every unit of transaction produces a digital exhaust. It's information, it's data, and you just your learning cycles get faster and faster and better. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think that's where we're going to start to actually see. Um, just better care, better care, not cheaper care, not better access. We're just going to be way smarter about what we do. And and and, mm-hmm. and I feel we're at a tipping point, but Will, you're maybe closer to it than I am. I don't know. I guess where I'm coming down is that we've made a lot of progress. It's time to push the thing over. Uh, we are still the only group now after the pandemic. Uh, we're still the only group still using fax machines. Uh, bankers, bankers and lawyers and real estate agents gave up on the fax machine during the pandemic. Only healthcare didn't. 
And I think that's a considerable patient safety issue and one that we should tackle in the next two years. The technology is moving so fast, right? Like we're in the era of communication technology. And so I find healthcare also locks into the modality of the day makes that law and then we're stuck with it. Yeah. So it was fax when, you know, and then tele, this word tele in front of, yeah. why are we saying tele? That implies telephony. You know, like It's like no one says telecommuting anymore, right? That was the thing of the 80s. Yes. It's not. And, and what is a portal? <laughs> so they get locked in a portal and even asynchronous text virtual care, it's either video or phone. Oh. No, it's not. Wait, so Teladoc just announced we're now bolted onto Amazon Echo. Okay. So now you can initiate and engage with your clinician all through voice with no, you're emancipated from any keyboards. It all gets written in the EMR. What's that? Is that, what is that text? Is that video? Is that chat? Where do we regulate that one? So soon it's going to be metaverse, which big healthcare orgs are working on. Like you're going to have all these modalities all the time, teleholoportation. So I just think that's another one I worry about. Like I looked at the Ontario For Medical sure. Association, you know, agreement where they've decided these three modalities are going to get priced by the minute. I'm like, those are gone in two years, guys. Keyboards are going to be gone. There'll be no apps, no laptops, no iPads. Then what? By the way, the answer to uh, what is a portal is a portal is a small round window into a <laughs> ship, usually near or below the waterline. Um. A final question for you both is, I want to ask you guys if you've ever had a question you've wanted to ask each other, but haven't yet asked. Oh, I've got one, Will. Okay, go ahead. You know, I look at like all the different major projects you've been part of and initiatives, you know, would you point to one that you would say would be the one where you've had the biggest impact on Canadian healthcare? Obviously, the thing that I'm uh, uh, very proud of at the moment um, and talking a lot about is the report that I did last summer for Health Canada that talked about some of the topics we're doing here on virtual care. Um, I mean, I've been um, thinking about those modernization uh, questions uh, back since I worked with um, Matthew Mendelssohn and the team at the Moet Center uh, 10, 12 years ago. And it's really been very satisfying to be able to think about that and have the chance to do a work that, you know, was translated into both official languages and, and got broad circulation. I guess my question for you, and this is probably a work in progress too, Zaina, but I'm really, really excited and curious to hear where Teladoc fits in the aging population, because, you know, you did the book on aging a while ago, um, and I'm sure that as you've come to Teladoc, you've been thinking about it. Any early insights? I, 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 that I haven't had the chance to ask you about. So as you know, I mean, the company started and the way it grew was by uh, in the U.S. market where the employer pays for care. So Teladoc could come in and create a great offering and experience at a lower cost with better outcomes. So it's a pretty slam dunk value prop for an employer. Um, but that's a young, generally population, right? So now that Teladoc's moving into the entire end-to-end -end care model for anybody, uh, that is where we're going next. I can't share too much more. But, uh, you know, having someone like me, and we also recruited Ozzy Balorchi, who oh, was the cool. head of innovation yep. at Rivera, you know, so we, you have two of the top aging innovation people, I think, you know, for sure in Canada are now part of the Teladoc team. And we're now getting brought into the, um, the R&D engine on our, uh, our aging and care at home offering. So that's pretty exciting. So maybe in a year, you'll see a little bit more. For Someone listening to this episode today, uh, you know, whether they're a frontline worker, a leader, you know, whomever, a, 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 you know, a student, what's one takeaway you want them to do to, you know, to, you know, help with that? You know, we both mentioned the tipping point to help, help push and get this get healthcare moving and more action, more impact. What's something they could do, you think? I can go first. Yeah, go ahead, <laughs> I coach people on this all the time. So, you know, you know, not everybody has the ability to hang out in the future the way me and Will do. Like 100% of what we do is creating the future. It's a very yeah. privileged place to be. And 
damn is it hard work. I always say I have a collaboration <laughs> hangover every morning. Um, but, um, uh, but no matter where you are, wherever, student, administrator, clinician, department chair, I don't care. I always say at least 10% of your capacity, that's a half a day a week at a minimum, has got to be blowing up the past and, and putting it together for the future. You got to be spending mm-hmm. and hanging out some time there because every minute you're not doing that, every minute you're reinforcing the status quo, you're actually making a wider gap between where we need to be and where we are. So that's kind of my advice. Mine is for both um, uh, the average Canadian or, or the patient and, and for the providers as well. Take control of your technology. Don't look to others to solve your user problems. And, you know, I guess the the negative restatement of that would be don't be a tech victim. Um, if, if If your technology that you're using in your healthcare experience sucks, get rid of it. Actively advocate to get rid of it and get something better. Don't simply accept uh, bad tech. Uh, you, you don't have to suffer. I really want to thank you both for just a really engaging and enthusiastic conversation. Thank you so much for talking to us today. A real pleasure. Enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah, that was fun. And Ellen, I can't believe you harnessed uh, in me and Will. That's a, that's a miracle. So well done. You have just been listening to our interview with Zaina Kayat and Will Falk. Zaina is Vice President Client Success and Growth at Teladoc Health. Will is a Senior Fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute and has an appointment at the University of Toronto as an Executive in Residence at Rotman. For more information about HEROC and to listen to past episodes of Healthcare Changemakers, go to our website, HEROC.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. You can hear more episodes of Healthcare Changemakers on our website, heroc.com, and on your favorite podcasting apps. If you like what you hear, please rate us or post a review. Healthcare Changemakers is recorded by Heroc's communications and marketing team and produced by Podfly Productions. Follow us on Twitter at, at Heroc Group or email us at communications at heroc.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you.